Good morning. We are glad to have you with us. Uh, is the microphone on? Can you hear me? All right. Well, Pastor Mark let me teach today because I am having him preach today. So uh, that was our original schedule. Well, maybe, I don't know if it was original or not. Uh, we had a schedule and COVID threw that off. So uh, we're, maybe we're at uh, fourth and three and we're debating, but we decided to punt. So here we are. So. But we are uh, delighted to have you. There's still a lot of people that are out. Uh, in fact, I'm not even sure what's happening with kids' ministries today. It, it changed every five minutes yesterday. Uh, people that were out or their kids are out or spouses out or something. And so continue praying for uh, each other and uh, the church. And eventually we'll all get back to somewhat of a normal schedule, uh, whatever that looks like, right? So... But uh, thank you. We've been uh, in touch with a lot of different people trying to encourage and strengthen them and pray for them. And uh, I know, boy, I could think of probably a dozen right off the top of my head today that are out probably with COVID. Some have been tested, some haven't, but uh, the symptoms are all pretty much the same. So, uh, but, you know, Brian or Gary asked me, it, it, for those of you that haven't had it, it just felt like the flu. So that was kind of... Uh, at least if you get this variant, that's what I can tell you. But uh, I had a sinus infection afterwards, so that, that was kind of what made mine weirder than just weird. So uh, I had mine at Kaiser, so yeah. yeah. All right, well, uh, thank you. Let's uh, continue in the series. Pastor Mark started this, uh, Avoiding Confusion. H how many of you would agree that the world is full of confusion today? Uh, people don't even know if they're a boy or a girl. That's how confused they are, right? Um, and there's, then it goes from there, right? Uh, in fact, uh, Aaron was sharing with me a new law passed in California that on your death certificate, is that, did I get it right? On your death certificate, you can actually designate, I don't know how that works if you're already dead, but you can designate what you were, boy or girl, or what you want to be, I guess, for eternity. Uh, I, I don't know, but... Uh, I'm not even sure of the purpose of that, but anyhow, we live in a very confused world, and the, the answer to confusion is the scriptures, right? I mean, you and I do not have to question life or the difficulties or the struggles because we know ultimately that God is in control. Uh, one of our family members uh, lost their job yesterday. Uh, very heartbreaking, disappointing, gut-wrenching, you name it, situation. But ultimately, you know what the answer was? God's in control, right? As hard as that is, and some of you have been there with these kind of doctor phone calls, I'm sorry to have to tell you, but, right, that phone call, or maybe law enforcement called and said, look, I'm sorry, or they showed up at your door, one of your relatives has passed, uh, or an attorney sent you a piece of paper and he said, this is going to happen, uh, right? We go through this. This is not abnormal. You know, God's people are not protected uh, from the, the wild issues of life. But the good thing is, you and I have the scriptures. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the biblical account of creation. Now, I look around the room, and probably for the most part, most of you don't debate uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? You're not confused about that. We, we get that. But there are some intricate details about it that will help you and I understand this so that we can better communicate to the next door neighbor, the family member, the coworker that says, I can't get it. Why do you guys think that science is less important or less accurate than the Bible? And so we're going to deal with some of those today, and I think it's going to be encouraging to you and help you with this. You know, our understanding, right, of everything science is the Bible. And it's unique, right? Even, you know, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. All right, thank you, Ward. You were the first one to get that, All right? In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. His understanding of why he could sail and not fall off the end of the earth came from where? The Word of God, right? The Old Testament that teaches that God created the world as a sphere. 
right? Not a flat piece of paper that when you get to the end, pray and hope all goes well because you're going to sail off the end, right? And so we're going to look at this. Let's pray together and uh, we'll talk through this this morning. Father, thank you. Thank you for our church, Lord, that uh, continues to hold high and esteem the scriptures. Lord, today we want to elevate the word of God to the point that where there is no confusion, there's no doubt. Lord, we do pray for many people because they've heard, they've studied, they've seen, they've experienced something that has caused confusion in their mind about life or gender or even creation. And so we ask today that you would illuminate the scriptures, use the Holy Spirit uh, in my life as I teach and in the lives of these that listen. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Here, here's an interesting uh, statistic if you look at this on the screen. 2007, notice in the bottom right-hand corner, 50% of Americans were very familiar with creationism. Okay? 2007 was not that long ago. Okay? Notice what happens from 50% in 2014. Okay? So we went from 7 to 14, which if we just say 21, there was another 7 years. Right? So if it dropped from 50 to 38 in 2014, what number might it be if we actually had this research study done today? Right? It's probably far less than 38%. And here's the thing. Uh, science doesn't prove one way or another about creation. Right? It's a what? Theory. Okay? Uh, if your doctor, well, sometimes they do, they operate off of a theory, right? Uh, we're thinking, we understand, we don't know why, we can't prove it with a lab test, uh, but our theory is this is this, right? And this might be some of what we've just experienced for the last two years, right? Some theories, some understanding, some really educated guesses. Science does not prove one way or the other. However, I think as we understand ministries like Answers in Genesis, Dr. Ken Ham and uh, there's a number of other ministries around the world and around the country that are very similar to that, the more they do research, there is a lot of science that is pushing the biblical envelope and they are understanding exactly what God said in the scriptures, science is backing that up, right? Uh, we don't need science, right? There's a lot of things I don't understand about science, uh, and so it really doesn't matter. If God's Word teaches me, then I'm going to go with that rather than even try or understand what science is. So uh, there should be an outline in front of you if you want to fill in the blanks or doodle in and fill in the circles. <laughs> uh, some people multitask, right? That's what you're doing, multitask during Sunday school. There are extras up here as well if we ran out on that uh, back table. I want to, uh, I have a number of quotes today, and so uh, probably far more than I would normally quote to you, but I want to take you through this uh, and help you understand this. The idea of denying God as the creator has been around since the early church, right? We think this started like in the 1950s, right? Now, this, this idea of denying God God as creator was a first century and probably earlier than that. But here's the passage, and it may be on your outline. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 5. For this they willingly, that's a very key word in this. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Notice in that verse, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. Um, when you look at, is that even on your outline? I may be ahead of your outline. Okay, it is there. Um, it's not just the what problem. They didn't believe in God as creator. It's the why issue. They willingly chose not to believe in God as a creator. And I would guarantee that the ma vast majority of people today that are struggling with or maybe confused about God is creator, they are willingly choosing this. Now, give me some feedback. Why would someone want to deny God is creator? Nancy? Yeah. 
Okay, and I, and I would say that's probably the number one, right? Accountability. Somebody else. What does taking God out of the equation do for us? Okay, yeah, lack of information, right? Or they, you know, well, science doesn't prove that, right? Who, who's their Bible? Science, right? They're trying to elevate science for that. Uh, has science changed over the years, by the way? <laughs> remember when they used to attach leeches to your body? Well, you may not remember that, but you've heard about that, right? <laughs> right? That's probably before our time, right? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Anything else? So we understand the, the willingness to deny God as creator has a lot to do with this idea of accountability. And so they're denying that in a great way. Um, and I think with that accountability issue is, is the whole God is judge issue. Do I want to stand before a holy and righteous God as judge? Right? No one would want to. You and I included. However, we have Jesus Christ, the advocate, right? The one that goes to the Father for us and the one who is standing between us. And when God sees us, he sees us through Christ and therefore he sees us, what? As a child of God. Sinless in that sense, right? We know we're not sinless, but he sees us pure, righteous, justified before Christ. Here's one of these quotes. Uh, courts, so legal courts, have even ruled that teaching the theory of intelligent design, okay, intelligent design is the idea that there is so much evidence leaning towards God as creator, right? Scientific evidence leaning towards this was created by an intelligent being God. Uh, courts have ruled even that teaching the theory of intelligent design, the idea that the complexity of life around us could not possibly have come about by random chance, Big Bang Theory or evolution, right? Uh, as a contrast to evolution cannot be allowed because it's too close to creationism. So even secularists, okay, people that don't believe the scriptures, people that are not born again, people that are teaching science classes, they can't even by law teach intelligent design even if they wanted to. Now, Let's flip that around for a moment. Does that not only prove the idea that intelligent design is leaning towards God as a creator? Absolutely, right? And so they've got the courts on their side that are trying to negate the idea that this world is too perfect, it is too orderly, it is uh, not random, right? We can predict the tides, we can predict the sunrise, we can predict the sunset, right? We know all of those things, because why? Intelligent design. God created it that way. It didn't randomly mutate from one thing to another. Um, evolution, not based on science, but on suppositions and theory. So let's, you can start filling in blanks if you'd like to. The testimony of the creator, his revelation. Now, here's the thing that sometimes I think Christians get wrong. We want to prove or use science one way or the other. But here's the thing. In the beginning, no one was there, right? There was no Christian, no preacher, no evangelist, no scientist, right? There was no one there. And that's why for you and I, understanding the scriptures are the source. And most of us, and I think answers in Genesis, if you follow them or listen to them, much at all. If you don't get the first 11 chapters of the Bible right, you're going to miss everything else, right? That is the foundation. That is why it is so important that we take biblical creation in the beginning God created because it sets the tone for everything that happens all the way through the book of Revelation. Um, a number of years ago, uh, there was a, a Christian school that uh, was very close by uh, that was using a book as their curriculum, and here was the title of the book, In the Beginning, or no, God Said It, and Bang, It Happened. Now think about that title for a moment, God Said It, and Bang, It Happened. 
right? We know what the Big Bang is, right? That there was this gigantic scientific explosion, and out of that explosion, everything happened, right? Do you remember Pastor Mark's illustration from last week, the silver dollars across the state of Texas, right? Two feet deep, and by random chance, you act, actually found the one that was marked, right? I mean, impossible. Think of the idea of a great big explosion creating everything that we know, right? I mean, that's nearly the same example finding a silver dollar in the middle of Texas, two feet deep, right? It's impossible. And yet, Christians are even buying into the idea that God somehow used evolution or God somehow used a big bang to create everything that we had. Now, I, I don't know about you. I, I mean, I'm not like IQ off the charts. But that takes a whole lot of thinking to kind of come up with that idea of how that actually might happen. And it takes more faith to believe that than actually that there was an intelligent design creator, God, and he spoke it all into existence. And so I think our faith and understanding of Scripture uh, is critically important to that. Here's two of those passages, Job chapter 38, verse 4 and 5. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Right? Remember the whole Job argument, right? Uh, and him kind of questioning God, and God comes back to him. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth? No one was there. This was a, in the beginning, God created, right? Follow the six days of creation, right? Man was not there on day one, right? right. Psalm 104, verse 5. Who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever? And so we understand that. So, understanding the revelation of God is important. Now, <clears throat> although nothing in science which is pro properly understood and interpreted contradicts the biblical account of creation, science is not our primary source, right? Now, do I think science can really back up creationism? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, some of you are maybe old enough to remember this in your science book, okay? Um, on one end of the scale was a man. And about six guys in between were these kind of monkey ape looking guys. And then it went back to something that was almost uh, undescribable, right? How many of you have had that in your science book, right? Yeah, just about everybody in the room, right? Was that true? No. Was it taught as truth? Yes right? They tried to get us to believe that there were all of these, and I think Lucy was the actual ape. I think the, the ape they found, uh, the skeleton remains was Lucy. That was the, what they named her. Uh, they didn't find any skeletons in between, right? They made that up and they sold it, taught it as truth, and they tried to get people to believe that that was there. Now, let's go over to this idea of uh, reliability. Now, I want to give you a quote here from Henry Thiessen, right? You don't know Henry Thiessen. I only know Henry Thiessen because I had to read his book in Bible college, right? So if you went to Bible college, uh, most conservative Bible colleges are, are using either Thiessen or maybe one or two others, but this is the guy, okay? Uh, and he describes what revelation is, okay? Because we, you know, we think of revelation and we think of what? The last book of the Bible, Right? But revelation is actually God making himself known to us, and creation is one of the greatest ways that God made revelation known to us. Revelation, according to Henry Thiessen, the act of God whereby he discloses himself or communicates truth to the mind, whereby he makes manifest to his creatures that which could not have been known in any other way. Right? What did Paul say in the book of Romans? That creation itself declares that there is a God. God was revealing himself to the world. Not that he had to, not that God needed us, but he chose to reveal himself to us through creation. Psalm 33, verse number 9, For he spake spoke and it was done he commanded 
and it stood fast. Can you imagine being there when God spoke the world into existence? I mean, just let your mind try to grasp that for a moment, right? There was nothing, and then there was light, right? There was nothing, and then there were animals, right? There was nothing, and then there were humans, right? This is the act of God speaking by revelation. Um, a couple different things about this. One is, and, and I'm ahead of myself on the outline there, if you're fo- trying to follow the scriptures, um, this issue of revelation, understanding, uh, God revealed his power to us, right? I mean, could any of us create not from nothing, right? Some of you create, like, artwork with your baking, right? Or uh, maybe, you know, something you've built, right? But you're not making it from nothing, right? You're taking flour and eggs and maybe yeast or uh, baking powder, baking soda, right? You're in getting all these ingredients that you've gotten from somewhere else and you're putting them together probably with a recipe that you got from somebody else, right? You know, we understand the difference in the creation of the world from nothing, right? Uh, the uh, word is ex nihilo, from out of nothing. There was nothing to gather together. There was no instructions. God spoke it together from that. God also reveals his self-existence, that he has always been, right? That, for me, that's one of the hard ones to get my mind around, right? That even before creation, right, which is probably six to 8,000 years ago, right? That's what most science, right, would lean towards a short, or they call it a young earth creation, right? Not millions of years, right? But, you know, and the whole evolution and processing and everything that is taught contradicts what really genuinely science does. Um, also, this idea that God's revealing that he's eternal, right? This is not, you know, the, the heavens and earth will pass away. But we know what? The word of God, right? God himself will never cease to exist. But then there's another one, that God is not only self-existent, but pre-existent, right? These are not in your notes, but they go with that. Let me read this to you. Uh, the evolutionist worldview, right? So Pastor Mark's series that he's doing is having a biblical worldview. I'm putting on my Bible glasses and I'm looking at everything through the Bible, right? So I'm understanding why people do what they do, <laughs> why people don't do what they do. I'm understanding why science and health and all the other issues of life, because why? The scriptures taught me these things, right? I'm looking at the world through biblical glasses, so if you look at it through a evolutionist idea, everything's going to be opposite, right? You're going to see things differently. The evolutionist worldview, on the other hand, sees matter, not God, uh, as preeminent. One author said it this way, the humanist worldview holds to evolution, rejecting the biblical teaching of creation of all things by God. It is a materialistic worldview which argues that matter and energy are all that exists. Think about that. Matter, right, blobs, and energy, right? And together, somehow, that's where you came from, right? Uh, one debate of scientists and uh, creationists, they said, from goo to you, right? <laughs> that's kind of the idea, right? There was a lot of goo, matter and energy and somehow you came out of that uh, some days we feel like and look like goo but uh, we know there's more you'll know this name the atheist scientist dr carl sagan right that goes back some time carl sagan stated the materialist view in his television series cosmos claiming the cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be Right? So it's just goo and energy. It's matter and energy that all that ever was and ever will be. Well, let me take you to a couple other passages here. 
Isaiah 43. I'm still trying to catch up to the screen, so if you're trying to find these. Isaiah 43, verse number 10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me. Does that sound like goo has the ability to know and believe? Right, no. We're a creation in the image of God. Uh, Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Right? There is so much for us as followers of Christ to understand and not buy into the confusion or buy into the lie of that. Here's a a quote. Frankly, it takes more faith to believe the uncaused cause. Right? I love that. The uncaused cause that brought everything into existence is matter and energy that one day exploded, bringing the universe and all that it is into existence than it takes to believe that an omniscient, omnipotent, eternal being, God, created it all, right? That's where our faith lies. We are not having faith in science. We're having faith in what God teaches us. All right, let's go to, on your outline, the reliability part, okay? I think the, again, the, the, some of the notions that Christians have, right? And this, we're talking not us, but us as Christians, we've tried to meld together the idea that, well, science has to be right and the Bible's right, so somehow we have to come up with a hybrid, right? When you think of a hybrid today, what what are you thinking about? Your car, right? It's part electric gas, you know, or battery gas, right? I mean, it's half and half. And so they're coming up with a, oh, there must be a hybrid solution to creation because all these scientists with all these degrees, they can't all be wrong. And though we know the Bible, I mean, that would look really bad if we as Christians tried to say, well, there's something wrong. So they come up with a hybrid. God created and it evolved. Or God created and bang, like the book I said, right? This was a junior high Christian school education book. God said it, and bang, it happened. What were they saying? They were hybriding the two ideas together that God spoke, and then there was a big bang, or God created, and there was a big bang, or God created uh, the amoebas, and then they evolved, right? That's a hybrid. Notice Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, and he is before all things, and by him All things exist or consist, depending on which version. This verse not only contradicts evolution, but it also contradicts the idea that God created the world and then somehow set it into motion and run on its own course. That's the hybrid version. God created and evolution took over, or God created and bang, it happened. The word consist, if you're back at Colossians 1, verse 17... Notice this, to place together, to band together, or to be composed of. Now, let's read the verse again. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. All things are placed together. All things are banded together. If God literally, right, remember the, the, he's got the whole world in his hands? I, I think it's actually more like this. If God wasn't holding the world together, it would not be as it is today, right? That's exactly what Colossians 1.17 is teaching us. God didn't just, you know, create it and then sit back and take a nap, right? God is holding it together literally as we do. And we'll talk about um, these in just a moment here. I've got some Uh, Let me take you to the the product part. This is where it it gets a little more interesting. The testimony about creation helps us understand this. Uh, Psalm 19, verse 1 through 3, the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, As we go through this, let me take you to the product. I want to get forward to this. We'll run out of time if if we don't be careful. Uh, 
God is a God of order. He has signed and appointed and designated places for everything that he made. Uh, it's interesting. I, I, I'm like a people watcher, right? Um, you know, airports, as much as we all hate to sit in an airport, I mean, it can be absolutely entertaining. And probably there's somebody doing the same thing to us. Look at that person over there watching all those people, right? So they're observing us while we're watching them. Uh, but people have, I mean, like some people are, are neaties and some are messies, right? You probably fall into one of those, right? Uh, every house, no matter how neat it is, probably has a junk drawer, right? You know, so we do it in various forms and things, and, and everything has a place. It might be the junk drawer, but it has a place, right? Uh, you know, on the outside, everything looks good, but on the inside, maybe not so good, right? Think about creation, and, and I'm going to read these to you because, you know, God placed earth in the ideal galaxy, um, notice this, the earth is part of the Milky Way galaxy, which is a spiral galaxy. Wonder where it got that name, right? The only kind suitable for life. Now, I, I don't understand that, right? But they have studied other galaxies. They understand uh, the oxygen, water, content, all of the things that goes into the science side, and there's only one galaxy that could sustain life, right? So, you know, if they wanted to send you on a, uh, what's the uh, Tesla guy's name? Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Isn't he the one that going into orbit, you know, a couple of those guys? Right? If he wanted to send you to a different galaxy, you couldn't live there. Right? It's impossible from a science standpoint. Okay, uh, Notice this, the ideal solar system. Less than 5% variation in the distance between the Earth and the Sun would kill all life either through excessive heat or excessive cold. Most of us have heard that one before. Right? 5%, right? I mean, that's a pretty insignificant number. Right? If, if the doctor told you, you know, I need to do surgery and uh, there's a 5% chance you won't make it, let's do it, man. I, I'm, you know, I'm tired of feeling this way, hurting this way, you know, whatever. 5%, man, I'll take my chances, right? 5% difference on that. We would either crispy critters or frozen, the movie, right? We would be done if we weren't in this. Jupiter's orbit. Uh, the gravitational field, right? What, what does gravity affect most in our area? Tides, right? You know, they know. They can predict it. It's all predictable. They'll tell you on, you know, March the 13th, they'll, high tide, low tide, right? It's predictable. <clears throat> Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, acts as a vacuum cleaner, right? Right now, while we speak, my iRobot is running through our house. Right? Right? This is Jupiter in our solar system. Without Jupiter's gravitational field, Earth could potentially be hit with the large fragments from outer space, which would have a devastating effect on all life. What are they talking about? Meteors, right? Now, there's, there's some t occasional times, right, where it happens, but there's far bigger meteors out there that are buzzing around, but what Jupiter in our solar system is protecting us from that. Let's talk about the sun. 90% of the stars within our galaxy are red dwarves. You knew that, right? Not dwarfs. Dwarves, right? Uh, our sun is a rare, perfect star to give off the precise amount of heat without producing a lethal amount of radiation. Last time you had an x-ray? Right? They covered half your body with some big lead thing, right? Trying to protect you from a radiation, right? Understanding if God did not place us exactly where he placed us, we would be fried with radiation. Let's talk about the moon for a moment. <clears throat> 
the ideal moon. If the moon were larger or smaller, it would cause our rotation around the sun to slow down or speed up and produce tides that caused flooding or were too small to maintain the health of the oceans. Now, think of all those verses that talk about how God created and in the beginning he created and he holds all things in existence. Colossians 1 verse 17, right? You know, I mean, you don't want to call people uh, that are unbelievers foolish, right? You're not going to win them by referring to them that way. But when you stop and think about some of these things, it's foolish to believe the way that they believe. In order to justify their behavior, in order to negate a God that will one day judge us, they're almost looking through a tunnel and saying, I'm going to take this amount of science and I'm going to ignore everything else that is out here because God has given it to us. All right, let's, let's talk about purpose. What's purpose mean? Do you have a purpose? Reason for existence. Why are you here? Right? There is a purpose in creation. Here's a, a good thought that we need to be reminded of once in a while. God does not need us, but he desires a relationship with us. Right? At this church, God does not need Pastor Mark or I. There's probably a million and one people that could do what we're doing. Right? Your job, your ministry, your whatever. God does not need you for that. In fact, what did he say in the Gospels? If we don't give him praise, he'll what? The rocks will cry out. Right? God can do anything he wants to do. You and I, in humility, need to be reminded, wow, God, thank you that you chose to have a relationship with me. And creation was the way he did that, right? There, there, there wasn't this uh, invisible, you know, um, ability between God himself and you and I, except for creation. Let's talk about this. Colossians 1, verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him, and what's the next word? And for him. Right? That's the verse right before verse 17 that we read just a few moments ago. God was the creator and he created us for himself. Um, and I, I think at times our... I, I don't want to use... I'll use the word self-image. Right? And I think you probably understand what we mean by that. But self-image affects a lot of things. Right? Uh, how you were raised, what you do now as an adult, right? all those things. But we understand in a bigger sense, there is a Bible self-image, a God self-image. Uh, I was listening to a podcast this week. Um, the lady's name was Christine Kane. And she has a ministry, I, I don't even know what the name of, A21 or something, uh, but she's in uh, 16 different countries with 19 different offices, and they are stopping women from being trafficked, okay? Uh, in fact, a dear friend of ours, uh, Pastor Charlie, some of you know Pastor Charlie, uh, missionaries they support in South America, unrelated, but doing the same thing. The wife was just murdered not long ago, and they haven't really even said uh, that publicly, but that is why. So this kind of ministry uh, is an incredible ministry that's happening in parts of the world that obviously uh, maybe aren't as safe as the United States, but rescuing women that are being trafficked, right? And she shared a little bit of her story. She was born in a hospital without a name. Nobody would claim her. Uh, she was raised uh, in multiple situations, uh, sexually abused in multiple ways, right? I mean, you name it, if bad can happen to somebody, it happened to her. And her human self-image was destroyed. 
but she got saved. She became a follower of Christ, and her self-image was transformed because she understood from a God standpoint, I was created by God and for God, and all of that, as bad as it was, doesn't matter now. There's purpose, right? And understanding uh, what we're talking about in understanding the idea of creation. You know, this wasn't just a gigantic world creation. This was a you creation, right? An individual, a person, someone that matters to God. God created us for purpose, and we get that. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good right? Put your name there. God created you, right? Take out your parents, right? Take out the biology, take out all of those things, and be reminded that you and I have purpose because God created us that way. Uh, let me take you, <clears throat> uh, just this idea of perfection. What's the most beautiful uh, nature scene that you, you've seen, right? Oceans, mountains, Grand Canyon. Tell me something. Where, where have you been that is beautiful? Where? Sunrise. We, where? Yellowstone. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> right. You, you, you want a few people that have seen that, right? Mount Shasta. Right. I mean, we could go on for days talking about gorgeous places, right? Beaches, sunsets, sunrises, right? You know, but all of that, even as beautiful as it is in perfection, it's been tainted by sin, right? Imagine what it was like prior to the fall, right? Because even in the, the most beautiful of places, there's still some weeds, right? Or at your beach, there's some seaweed maybe, right? I mean, even in gorgeous places, we still understand that there are some, you know, incredibly gorgeous things, but before the fall of man, before sin, they were better and we have to understand from a biblical standpoint our spiritual healing, the salvation that we have and our growth in righteousness is all of this process of God restoring us to that pre-fall, right? We can't be, we understand that sin nature is still there and all that, but right as we grow closer to Christ, we are becoming more like what it was prior to the fall. Um, let's talk about this for a moment. Um, we only have a couple minutes left. Biblical creation may be, may be the hottest topic being debated out there today. Right? I mean, there's a lot of things about Scripture and Christianity and so forth that's being debated and they're throwing rocks at, but um, understanding biblical creation could be this. And one of the indicators that truth of creation is so important is the amount of work the devil puts into undermining it, right? Uh, Dr. Ken Ham, right? Most of you have seen, even sometimes on uh, secular TV channels, we'll see it every once in a while, but uh, he started the Creation Museum now he's built the ark, right? I mean, literally a life-size ark. I have not seen the ark. I've seen the museum. Uh, I think you guys got to see uh, the ark. I mean, if you can go, it is worth the field trip, right? I mean, it's in Kentucky, just below the Ohio River. Uh, phenomenal. But, I mean, like Ken Ham has to live with security, this is a, a, just a Christian guy. I mean, call him a scientist, call him a pastor, a evangelist, or, you know, whatever title we want to give him. He has to live with security. Why? Because people hate Christianity in the, in the realm of biblical creation. They want to destroy this. This is the work 
of the enemy trying to undermine that. And this realm of rebellion here's, uh, takes us into that. Here's Isaiah chapter 14. You are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning. Right? You know the passage. Right? He rebelled against God and creation, biblical creation, is one of the hallmarks of Christianity. It is one of the things that, that a lot of people's faith will be either challenged or restored if they understand the scriptures and what it teaches. John 10, verse 10, the thief does not come but to still kill and destroy, right? That's what Satan is trying to do on that. Uh, and I think, again, I got so many other quotes here. Um, let me just jump forward for the sake of time. This road to restoration. Uh, years ago, right here in our church, uh, in fact, it was the time frame when we moved from this building to the new building, so 2003-ish. Uh, we had an individual who had become a follower of Christ. And I came to found that, find out later uh, that they actually had a science degree uh, from one of the UC schools in evolution. Right? And now, in their soul, right, in their mind, what do I do with this? multiple thousands of dollar degree because I understand that the Bible doesn't teach that. It is wrong that there is a difference. And it was a process of that individual moving from a highly respected degree that was highly paid for to understanding this is what God teaches. And I think as you and I understand you know, restoration happens in people's lives. You know, I just shared a story, Christine Kane, right? I mean, that's a pretty bad way to start your life. And now God is using her literally around the world for the cause of Christ to rescue women that are being trafficked. You know, and story after story after story after story, and some of your stories would fall into that as well. I was headed this way, and God saved me. I've been restored. I have a purpose in why I am here at this moment. Right? Remember the Old Testament? For such a time as this, this is why I am here, and it is for the glory of God. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for the time together today in your word. Thank you that truth always prevails. Whether it's us personally or whether it's the scriptures, we know that you are exalted in our lives when truth is proclaimed. And so Lord, I pray that uh, if anyone struggles, if there's confusion, that maybe this lesson would be shared in such a way. Maybe through the internet, someone would find this lesson and they would understand that the word of God is reliable and we can put our faith in the word more so than faith in some science of man. And we just are grateful that you've given us so much evidence that would incur and, and encourage our faith in you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hey, thanks for being here. Let's move next door. Pastor Mark is going to share God's word with us. <clears throat> Wow.